and believe and be set free. It is exciting to be here today. Why? Because this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has me, that the Lord has me. I don't know, I just get excited like that. I'm, forgive me. I mean, I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one that Jesus changed your life, but uh, <laughs> no, I'm going to uh, say thank you for all those that came today, and I want to say thank you to our visitors. We have a few visitors today. Um, <clears throat> we have something for you at the end of the service. Uh, just to say thank you for showing up, and if you want to stay connected to us, um, you're more than willing to. We won't stalk you or, you know, blow up your Instagram, Facebook, email, Snapchat, whatever it is. We won't blow you up. We'll just l let you know what we're doing and what's happening. Um, uh, it is a pleasure. It is a pleasure to inform you that the Bait of Satan Bible study has been going awesome, has been going great. Um, it's changing people, it's giving people a new perspective on how the devil tries to mess us up by being upset. Um, next thing, uh, the women's retreat, to my understanding, was a hit. It was amazing, in Janina's words. It was a great time. Uh, people were able to share, uh, bear their hearts before the Lord, and that there is exciting um, when, pe when God decides that he wants to change people and make you new. And that's what the God we serve is about, is renewing and uh, restoring things that have at one point in time been broken. Um, <clears throat> next thing is uh, Pastor Dave is out. He's on a small trip to Virginia taking care of some business. And uh, he pray for safe travels on his way back. Um, and I think that's all the announcements we have, right? Oh, and thank you to everybody that came out and helped uh, with the spring cleaning. Uh, we cleaned the carpets and did some other things uh, yesterday. It was a good time. I wasn't here, but it was a good time, I heard. <laughs> um, yeah. So let's pray. We're going to ask the worship team to come forward as we pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to be here to worship you to lift you up, Lord Jesus, and to hear of your words. We ask, dear God, that uh, during this time of uh, lifting up these songs to you, Father God, that you speak to our hearts, soften our hearts, prepare our hearts for the word that you have for us, Lord. And we ask, God, that <clears throat> through that time, Lord, that we may be changed, Father God, that you would um, find something in inside of us that does not belong, Father God. Take it out, remove it, Lord Jesus, so we can be acceptable and, and uh, pleasing to you, Father. That's all we ask is be pleasing to you. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Yes, you 
that again Willing we choose to surrender our lives Willing our knees will bow With all our heart, soul, mind and strength We gladly choose you to you because we can trust ourselves in you.
hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest faith, but only trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built. trust the sweetest thing, but only trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, God of we may strong in the Savior's love through the Darkness seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, worship team. Thank you always for doing such an excellent job during worship. Oh, Amen. We're blessed to have them with us. We're blessed to have people that have a, a heart for worship. And frankly, we're just blessed. <laughs> so we've been going through a series this month. Uh, in the book of Nehemiah, and 
That series is the series Rebuild. Rebuild. And in a quick overview, this is the last one that we're doing uh, in the book of Nehemiah the, uh, for this sermon series. And I'm going to give you a quick overview of what it was. And basically, Nehemiah worked for a king in a foreign land, and he had met up with one of his brothers and said, you know, how are things back home? And Nehemiah and his, uh, the, his brother had told him, he said, man, things are awful. They're actually in a state of disgrace. The walls have been torn down. The people are running amok, and it, it's bad. So Nehemiah, Nehemiah found favor in the eyes of the king. And the king sent Nehemiah with everything that was needed to rebuild the wall and get there safely. And in that, when Nehemiah got there, he brought the people together to rebuild, to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, to put the walls back to its former glory and even yet a better and greater glory. And God used Nehemiah to rebuild that city in a way that was never seen before. And as it was rebuilt, they made new changes. They made greater changes um, to maintain the commitment that they had made to God. To maintain the commitment that they had made with the Lord. And once they did that, once they began to maintain that, they had to realize where they came from before they could realize where they were at. You know, there's been times when I've been hiding or hiking in the woods, and or I'll give you this story. I went to Puerto Rico one time, and I went to go visit a friend. And this was before the beauty of GPS. <laughs> and I'm up, and they said, all you have to do is Anybody ever hear that before? All you have to do is, I say that all the time when I go to fix a car or something. And all, all I have to do is, and the next thing you know, I'm three hours in fighting with one bolt, right? But I said, all you have to do is go down this road, take a left, and next right, okay? And you'll get out. I'm like, cool, great. It was probably around 1130 at night. And I'm going down, and I'm on one side of the mountain. And I'm driving. I'm driving 20 minutes, and I'm in, out, up, down, all over the place. I get down, and I get to a point where I get, and I'm on top of my mountain again. And I look across, and I can see to the other mountain of where I was. I'm like, dude, I didn't want to get here. But I didn't know where I was until I looked back to see where I was at. Because I could see the house. There was only one house lit on that mountain. And that was the house that I was at. So I had to make my way back down and remember where I should have turned and turned. And it made it out of the mountain eventually two and a half hours later. <laughs> that stank. And um, two and a half hours later, I made it out of the mountain. But it took me going to a place one place and looking back to see where I was in order for me to understand where I had been. And sometimes we as people, we don't realize where we were until where we are until we realize where we've been. Amen? See, we, we, we go and we go and, and the, sometimes we tend to complain the entire time we're making steps forward. We complain about where we are, what we don't have, what we didn't get, what, how far we didn't make it in life. And then we stop and we look back and we realize that God has brought us further than we could ever brought ourselves. We look back and realize that we're at a place that if I hadn't gone through what I've gone through, God would have never been able to bring me to where I'm at now. See, in the book of Nehemiah, 
he experienced all these things. And, you know, as he rebuilt the wall, the enemy came in and tried to distract him from building the wall. And he stayed focused. He stayed focused. He said, no, we're going to return to the glory that was Jerusalem. And we're going to rebuild these walls. I'm going to ignore the naysayers. I'm going to ignore those ones that are trying to lie to me and tell me that I'm not going to be able to do this. And Nehemiah, in, in, his, in his tenacity to chase after this, he realized what Jerusalem was and he wanted to restore it. But he had to remember where he was at with the walls torn down and the people acting all wild and crazy. So I'm going to go to the first uh, uh, verse here. In the first verses, and we're starting going from 2 to 5, and it says, So on October 8th, Ezra the priest brought the book of the law before the assembly, which is included the men, the women, and the children, old enough to understand the book of the law, the Bible. Okay? Uh, back then was the Old Testament, the Torah, um, which, we don't, we, which we now have the New Testament along with the Old Testament. So he brought the book of the law uh, before the assembly, and this assembly included the men, the women, the children, all old enough to understand. So that's why we believe that as long as soon as you're old enough to understand the Bible, you should be held accountable to the Bible. Amen? So he faced the square inside of the water gate from early morning until noon and read aloud to everyone who could understand. All the people listened closely to the book of the law. Ezra, the scribe, stood on a high wooden platform that had been made for the occasion. To his right, Matiah, Shemaiah, Aniah, Uriah, Hikiah, and Messiah, Messiah. To the left stood Padiah, Mishael, Jaliksha, Hashem, uh, Hashabadad, Zechariah, Meshalom. That's some good names, right? Yeah. Ezra stood on the platform in full view of the people. When they saw him open the book, they all rose to their feet. Okay? We're going to analyze this real quick. So after the city's rebuilt and everybody's together, all the Levites, which are the leaders of the, of the city, the leaders of the church, if you will, they stood up and they began to prepare to read the word of God. And they opened it up. And as they opened it up, the people realized, they wait, wait a second. What he's reading has importance. It has significance. It means something. It's what got us here. It's the thing that brought us to Jerusalem. It's the thing that has maintained us. Even when we walked away, it's the thing that maintained us. So everybody stood up. There was reverence for the word of God. There was a reverence for the word that God had placed into the hands of the people. I think that nowadays we forget and we struggle with the reverence of the word of God. We struggle. We don't realize the power that is behind it. We know that there's power in the name of Jesus Christ. We know that God can save you. He can free you. He can heal you. He can deliver you. He can do all those things. But we forget that this is what told us he was coming. This is what told us that he would show up and heal, deliver, set free, and change lives. The word of God is what would do it. And the Bible says in John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Later on, in verse 14, it says, The word became flesh. That means that Jesus Christ was the living word of God. And we're, you know, we, we've taken the Bible and we're just like, it's, it's important, but it's not. But that's not, that's not the reality of it. The reality of it is that the Bible is, is, is so important to a Christian living. The Bible is so important for us to, to go back to. And 
there was a friend of mine at our gym. She says to me, she says, I've been doing devotions all the time. And I mean, they're good, but, and I said, listen, here's what you do. You grab a Psalms, okay, and you read it. That's pray, praise. And then you grab a Proverbs. That's going to be your wisdom for the day. And then read part of the, part of the New Testament, any part of the New Testament. And that, that's going to be your living in what God lived and how he lived. And she was like, man, I'll try it. And she's got back to me and said, man, it, it, it's resulted. It's resulted. It doesn't matter that it's the Old Testament. It's still resulted because those things are applicable today. They're applicable to our lives right now. The Bible teaches about finances, and not many people te- talk about that. The Bible teaches you to, to don't, you shouldn't get loans. <laughs> you, you become slave to the lender. And these are the things that we, we, we have to constantly turn back to the Bible so that we're, we, we, we should revere the Bible. We should know that when we open the word of God, it's just that. It's the word of God. And it doesn't make me more holy in, than you that I read more than you. It just makes me want more of God so that I can be closer to him. And then I can help you get closer to him. Because if those people around me did not serve or read the word of God, they would have have been able to speak into my life so that I could come closer to God. They wouldn't have been able to speak to me about my faults, about the things that I needed to change so that I could come closer to God. You see, when we rebuild as a people, when God wants to change us and he wants to rebuild us and change our lives, we need the word of God. And we need people around us to help us rebuild. We need people around us to lift us up in prayer. We need people around us that are going to tell us the truth of the things that we're doing so we can get them right. We need those people. That's how we rebuild. Going on to the next part. It says in, in, in Nehemiah 6, 8, and it says, Then Ezra praised the Lord, the great God of all people, chanted, Amen, Amen. As they lifted their hands, they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, uh, Shabbatiah, Hadiah, Mas- Maesiah, Kalita, Azariah, Josaba, and I practice these, Hanan and Pelea, then instructed the people in the law while everyone remained in their places. They read from the book of the law of God and clearly explained the meaning of what was being read, helping the people understand each passage. I want you, I want you to Help me understand that. What does that sound like to you? They got together and they talked about the law of God and helped each other understand each passage. What does that sound like to you? What does that sound like? I'm, I'm, anybody? It sounds like Bible study. That's exactly what it is. So when we have Bible study, it's not, for, it's not for us to be better than you. It's for so that we, we as a church, can better understand the word of God. It's we as a church, because sometimes I get revelation that you don't get, and you get revelations that I won't get. I can't tell you how many times I've, I've had Bible study with, like, young kids. I'm talking maybe about eight, nine years old, and they say what is it? And you ask them, what does this mean to you? And they say something that completely blows your mind. You're like, wow, I never thought about it that way. And you begin to change because of the revelation that someone else got that you can apply to your life. 
That sounds like Bible study to me. And in order for us to rebuild, we have to begin to have those little Bible studies. We have to begin to meet so that we can uplift each other in the times of our needs, that we can encourage each other through the word of God. We're going to rebuild, but we've got to rebuild on a foundation that can't be shaken. And that foundation is the word of God. That foundation is the word of God. How many times have we built things up with our own thoughts and we, we do what the Bible, we think the Bible says instead of what the Bible actually says? Things begin to get torn down little by little by little until they crumble because they weren't built on the pure foundation of the word of God. And we struggle with that. We'll struggle with it until we bring it back and put it to the word of God. Amen? So where are we at now? Now we revere the word of God. We, we hold it in high esteem. We say that the word of God has to mean something to me. That when I read it, I got to know that God is speaking to me. Two, I want to get together with those that are around me. I want to get together with those people that are like-minded like me and chase after the presence of God so we can get there not alone but together. Chapter 8, verses 9 to 10. Then Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priests, scribes, and Levites, who were interpreting for the people, said, Do not mourn or weep such a day as this, for the day is sacred and the day of the Lord your God. For the people had all been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. And Nehemiah continued, go and celebrate with the feast, rich food, sweet drinks, share gifts of food, and the people who have had nothing prepared. This is the sacred day of our Lord. Don't be dejected or sad, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So what happens? They begin to speak the word of God. They begin to read the law. And, and people begin to cry. They begin to weep. They begin, they're in great sorrow. And everybody's crying and weeping as the book and the word of God is being read. Why? Because they realize how far they have gone from God. They realized that God had given them a city. He had delivered them from way back when, from their ancestors' times. He pulled them out of Egypt. He got them through the desert. He pulled them in, uh, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, he pulled them out of Egypt, got them through the desert, and brought them to the promised land. He had delivered them. He had set them free, and he gave them an entire city where they would be. And everybody started to come back to the city. And they realized where God had brought them from. And they began to weep and mourn because they had fallen away from God so far. They had fallen away from the Lord so far. And then they realized that even before Jesus Christ, there was grace. Even before Jesus Christ died on the cross, there was forgiveness. He said, don't mourn. Don't mourn. Don't weep. Don't weep. This is the day he has brought you to here. He has brought you this far. You're still alive. You're still a people. You're still a nation. You're still within the walls. God has had grace on you. He's had forgiveness for you. You have the opportunity. You've realized you've done wrong, but you're still at a place where you have the joy and the love of God. You see, sometimes we fall away. Some of us will fall away from God. Some of us will fail God. We will fail God. It's definite. Each and every one of us will fail God. But God will bring you back. He will bring you back if you're willing to realize that what you were doing was wrong and repent of it. That's what these people were doing. They're saying, I was wrong. God, forgive me. God, please set me free from the way that I've been acting. Change me. Change my life. And they began to weep. And if we do the same thing when we walk away and we, and we get away from God, if we change those things, then guess what? God will forgive us as well. 
he will forgive us in the same manner. We have to know that. We have to understand that God is a God of forgiveness. God is a God of change. And once you accept the change that he wants to bring to you, he will forgive you. The Bible says that don't be dejected or sad, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. That means that even in your mourning and your sorrow, there's got to be some kind of joy down deep inside of you that I know I'm coming out of this. I know that I'm going to make it past this. I know that God has a plan for me. I know that God is moving somewhere because I'm, I'm in your presence. I'm going to seek you. I'm going to chase after you. And as I chase God, I know that you have all things in your hands, Father. The Bible says the, right, the steps of the righteous man are ordered. And I am righteous not because of my works. I'm righteous because you died on the cross for me, washed my sins away, and now I'm chasing after you. So my steps are ordered. My steps are ordered. Once I chase and I seek after God, and I want God to change me, I want God to move inside of me. The Bible says that my steps are ordered. We talked about Joseph a couple weeks ago and how he was put through the ringer. His brothers sold him into slavery. And after he was sold into slavery, he made his way up and his boss's wife tried to tried to push herself up on him, and he ran, and then she lied about it, and he was thrown into jail. And then after he was thrown into jail, he interpreted a dream for someone. And after the dream was interpreted, he said, don't forget me. And the guy forgot about him. And two years later, then they come to remember who he was. Joseph was put through the ringer, but he remembered that he had a God that had already ordered his steps he had a God who had his steps ordered. And sometimes because our steps are ordered and God orders them doesn't mean that we're not going to walk through some mess. It doesn't mean that we're not going to experience hardship. Just because God ordered your steps, it doesn't mean that we're not going to feel pain and we're not going to feel sorrow. That's not what that means. It means that God, in the midst of the mess, he's there. It means that in the midst of your pain, he's there. It means that in the midst of this sorrow, he is there. That's what that means. That means that your steps are ordered. And as you go through that, God has ordered that on the other side of these things, you will have victory. You will, have, uh, uh, you will be okay on the other side. Come on, church. If, if you're listening to me, just say amen once. <laughs> You, you have to know, you have to know that, that God is with you in this. You have to know that God is moving with you. As long as you're repentant, you're sitting inside the walls. The walls are rebuilt, and now you're in there, and God is with you, and the joy of the Lord is your strength. Church, come on. I get excited. I get excited about it. I get excited about the fact that when I fall, I know God is with me. That when the struggle comes, if I lost my job, God is with me. If I lost my family, God is with me. If I've been told I'm sick, God is with me. It doesn't matter what happens. God is with me. As long as I'm with him, he's with me. Hmm. Hmm. Come on, church. I'm... I'm, I felt like preaching this morning. See, <laughs> because the Bible says that, 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 that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It says it right here in Ephesians 6, 12. It says, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood, but against enemies, rulers, and authorities, unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. That means that what we're dealing with is not just flesh. What we're dealing with is not just our own desires. What we're dealing with is not just our own uh, things that we feel we need to accomplish, but the things that God wants done. Amen. See, the devil is real. 
If you believe in God, if you believe in Jesus, then you must know and understand that there is a devil. He's not the opposite because he was created by God. He was created as an angel. He's not the opposite. It's just what he chose to do that was opposite to God's will. And see, when we want to chase after God, there's going to be things that hold us back. There's going to be things that try and keep us from showing up to church and showing up to Bible study. There's going to be things that are going to keep us from doing the right thing. I can't tell you how many times uh, I, I've been at a place where I've had the opportunity to say something I shouldn't have said or do something I shouldn't have done. But God just kind of held me back. He kind of said, hold up, grab me by the collar and said, oh, wait a second. Maybe you shouldn't say that. Maybe you shouldn't do that. Because God has a way of handling things in the way that we don't. And that spirit of, of, of anger rises up inside of us sometimes. And, or that spirit of, of wanting to do the bad thing, whether it be fornication, whether, whether it be lusting after things, whether it be pornography, whether it be drugs, it doesn't matter. Sometimes when we feel that urge to go back, the spirit of God pulls you away from the spirit of whatever you're trying to do. See, in the rebuilding process, in the rebuild process, once you revere God and you realize that what you've done wrong is wrong and you change your life and you want to chase after God, he wants to give you the joy. He wants to give you that peace. He wants to give you that place where you can feel his grace and his love over your life. He wants to give you that, but you have to want it. See, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. God is a gentleman. He will never force you because if he forced you, then we'd be robots doing the great will of the almighty master. He's still the almighty master, but the almighty master lets you choose. The king of kings and lord of lords, the one that created you and gave you breath and put the blood flowing warm in your veins, he's the one. He gives you a choice. He lets you choose. But he shows you his benefits. He says, I gave my son on the cross for you. He shed his blood and experienced anguish, pain, and betrayal for you. He experienced all those things so that you could have freedom when you walk with him. And sometimes freedom, let me share this with you, freedom doesn't look like, oh, well, I'm not going to experience it. I'm free from that. No, it means that I'm going to experience it, and sooner or later, I'm going to come out of it. Because sometimes God has to build your character. Everybody knows I'm big on going to the gym, right? In order for you to get stronger, you have to go through something. In order for you to get stronger, you can't do a push-up or 30 push-ups without doing one first. I remember there was a point where I was thinking about going into the army. And I was like, I got to get my push-ups right. And I was about 30 but at the time, 31 years old, and I was going to go into the army and just go for it. And I'm like, man, I got to get my push-ups because they do you, give you a little test. And I got in and I started doing push-ups before I started, you know, before I got to the, the test. And I was like, okay, I can only do 25. And 25. And every night I did 25 push-ups. 25 push-ups. The next week, I did a couple more. The next week, I did a couple more. When it came time to do the test, I was able to do 50 push-ups in under a minute. 50 push-ups. Ask me to do that now, it's not going to happen. But then, 20 years ago, I would have been able to do that. But why? It's because I pushed myself at a place where I continued to repetitiously 
Go through the pain and the hurt and the struggle to get just one more. Just one more. Just one more. And God is telling you that when you're experiencing something and you're going through something and you can't take any more, just take one more step. Just take one more step closer to me. Just get one more step closer to me. Take one more step. Read your word. Take one more step. Instead of complain and pray about it, and take, just take one more step. Go to that Bible study. Make time. Just take one more step. Go ahead and say praise God out loud and at work, at home, on the street. Just take one more step. Raise your hands during worship. Just take one more step. See, it's just taking one more step, and all those steps is going to build character in you so that when it comes time that you're so pressed from the outside and you know like when you take an orange when you squeeze it what the first thing that comes out is orange juice right so when you're pressed and you're squeezed the first thing that comes out of you that you're so full of would be Jesus hmm hmm See, when you're so pressed and you're so full of the word of God, the first thing that should come out of you is Jesus. You know, I like the story that Dave tells about when they were coming back from Florida and they had the trailer and they all of a sudden they hit a, uh, might have hit a Burmese mountain dog or something, a St. Bernard. They hit a St. Bernard. And they hit this St. Bernard, and they lock up the wheels and the trailer sideways. They came this close to the median, and Dave, all he could hear was Janina saying, Jesus, 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 Jesus. <laughs> that may be the very thing that got him out of there, Jesus. But when you're pressed, and the first thing that comes out of your mind, the first thing that comes... Out of your soul, the first thing that comes out of you is Jesus when you're pressed. And I think that we, as a people, have to come to that point that when we're pressed, it's the joy of the Lord that comes out of us. When we're pressed and we're shaken, that all the Bible studies that we attended and applied, see, because we can attend church, but if we don't apply it, it's different. Francis Tan put it this way. He said, he said, imagine this. Football team sets up on the line. They call a timeout. They go back to the sideline and they call a play. Coach says, we're going to do this, this, and that. Stop right on three. Ready, break. They go out. And they just stand at the line and let the clock roll. Delay a game. They go back. They call another play. Wide left. On three. Ready. Break. And they just stand at the line and wait for the clock to roll out. How much sense does that make? It doesn't make any sense, does it? To call a play and come to the line and wait and let the clock run out. It doesn't make any sense. But that's exactly what we do when we come to the church and we learn what we should do. And we're told that we need to read the word of God and we need to come close to God. That's exactly what happens when we take this home and don't run any plays in real life. It's what we're called to do is run the play. So let's run the play. Let's take what we learn here and, and run with it. Church, God loves us. Just like he, he loved the people of Jerusalem back then. And he allowed them and he showed Nehemiah favor to build the wall again. And to bring the people back to Israel. And they, they saw the reverence of God. They saw how good he was and the grace was. And they began to praise and worship. And he rebuilt the wall. And they mourned. And they were reminded that God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is over you. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Let that be reminded to you. Amen.
Let's stand. We're going to pray and dismiss. God, we thank you for today, Lord. We thank you for everything that you've done, everything you do, Lord Jesus, every place that you have brought us out of, Lord Jesus. We thank you. Father God, and we know that we could have not been there without you. We could have not taken those steps without you, Father God. And we know that even as we go through life, Father God, in the midst of the struggles and the pain, we know that you are there. And we thank you, Father God, because you have ordered our steps. You have taken us, Lord Jesus, to a place where we can see you, receive you. And Father God, Father God, chase after you, God. Lord, we ask that you bless us and you be with us, Lord Jesus, during this week, that you show us who you are, Father God. Show us in the places where we didn't see you. Show us in the places, Father God, where we thought we wouldn't see you, Lord Jesus. Let us look back and remember where we've come from, how you have saved us and kept us. We worship you, Jesus, and we thank you for everything. In your name we pray, amen and amen. God bless you guys. Have a beautiful week. We'll see you next week. God bless you guys. Next next week is our Easter service, so um, bring a friend. Amen? God bless you guys.